Hello everyone, it's me, your curator, Kevin Adkison, with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today I am back at the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Smith House, which has been part of the Cranbrook collections since 2017. And per a viewer's request, uh, Ian McDonald, the head of the Cranbrook Ceramics Department, I have decided today that we will touch on a number of highlights from the Smith family's collection of ceramics. So if you want to know more about the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Smith House, you can sign up for a tour. They start again on September 11th and they run through November 29th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at one o'clock. You can also go back in time on Facebook, and I did do an hour-long video tour of the house. Just to catch you up to speed, um, the house was built in 1950 for school teachers Melvin Maxwell and Sarah Stein Smith. Mr. and Mrs. Smith taught in Detroit public schools. It was their dream to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house, and they worked incredibly hard. They scrimped and saved. Uh, until they were able to commission, build themselves as contractors, and then move into this 1950 Usonian house made of uh, Tidewater Red Cypress, concrete, glass, and brick. And brick will be the first ceramic that we talk about. Um, though we don't usually think of bricks as being ceramics, they are essentially um, a very ancient form of pottery where clay has been dug out of the earth, shaped in a mold, uh, released, dried, and then fired in a kiln. So with that, um, I wanted to show you just what a beautiful day it is here in Bloomfield Hills, a sunny 80 degrees, uh, and that we are making a lot of progress on our landscape restoration. And hopefully that will be in tip-top shape uh, by the time tours resume. We're grateful to our friends at Fleur Detroit who are working so diligently on creating the new landscape. So welcome inside to the main living room of the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House, which overlooks this gorgeous man-made pond that we share with our five neighbors. And again, the house was completed in 1950. And I thought that we would talk about ceramics just along this shelf and in the main rooms. Part of the amazing nature of the Smith family collection uh, is that they really mostly collected decorative art. So there's very few paintings in the house, uh, which was sort of Frank Lloyd Wright's wish. He thought people had terrible taste in paintings. And so he designed his homes to not give you any wall space for paintings. We'll start by talking about the works that are along this built-in bookcase, which not only precluded the homeowner from hanging paintings, um, it also provided storage in this very unusual shaped house. And it's also part of the structural system. There's no vertical balloon frame. There's no beams in this wall. It's a sandwich board construction. And so the bookcases and the uh, 35 roughly foot blue bench are part of what is making this structurally sound in order to hold up the roof. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith started collecting as soon as they moved into the house, really, uh, but they had no money. They were trying to pay off the builders who had worked nights and weekends for way less than they were worth. They were also trying to build the furniture that Frank Lloyd Wright had designed. Uh, and so at first, Mr. Smith could only collect things um, things that he could afford or things that he could bargain down. But at a certain point, an artist told him, you know, I'm not going to go any lower on the price, but if you want to buy this on a payment plan, that would be fine with me. And so Mr. Smith began buying art on a payment plan. A lot of what we're going to see today were pieces that were collected uh, sort of from around 1960 to 1984 when Mr. Smith died. But one of the very first pieces to come into the house is this ceramic vessel. And I love this piece. 
We don't know the artist. If anyone has any ideas of who might have made it, send them in the comments. <coughs> Excuse me, something caught in my throat. Um, but I just love the sort of three asymmetrical handles, as well as this beautiful foot that comes down to the base. And this appears in photographs of the home as early as 1953. And so it's one of the very first pieces that the Smiths collected. And I think it has a very high probability to come from a Cranbrook artist or another local maker. As we'll see as we move around, the Smiths did collect quite a bit of Cranbrook artwork, uh, whether that was student artwork or whether it was um, artwork from a Cranbrook graduate. And then there are pieces that are from other artisans that I don't know how they got them. So we will get started um, with this lovely 1956 piece here. Um, from an artist, E. Forster. Don't know anything more about it. Um, there's also, um, above that piece, this adorable little series of pieces that came from the um, Mobach ceramic, which is a firm in the Netherlands, which has been producing work since the 1890s. The first piece that I know much more about um, is this vessel here. Now, this is by Don Reitz, Reitz um, who was a pioneer in this in reviving the salt glaze technique. Uh, and Mr. Reitz, he taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for most of his career, over 50 years there. And he's credited with reviving salt glaze pottery in American studio pottery. Now, if you don't know what salt glaze is, it's a very ancient technique. It goes all the way back to the Romans and even before them. Uh, and it involves adding salt into the kiln as the piece fires. And you throw the salt in and it has a reaction. The sodium and the silica in the clay have a reaction and they form a sodium silicate glaze. And so this glassy texture, uh, as well as this sort of orange peel texture that maybe the camera is picking up that comes from the salt glaze pottery. And it's a technique that just fell out of favor as pottery became more industrialized. Um, and so it's something that in the 1960s, he was able to revive and is really one of the sort of premier artisans working in salt glaze earthenware. The iron oxide spots that you see are something that comes out a lot in vessels here at the Smith House, and it's something that was quite popular in the 60s and 70s. You see a lot of these iron oxide glazes and reactions on sort of studio pottery of the era. Now, let me grab my gloves here, because I want to turn a few things over. If anyone has any questions as we move along, feel free to type them in. I'm gonna put the camera down here and get my gloves on. We're going to, even though I just washed my hands, I'll handle these pieces with gloves because some of them have metallic finishes on them and the metal uh, would not appreciate the oils from my hands. So I'll just wear these for the rest of the tour. Now, this piece here, uh, which doesn't look necessarily like much, it's sort of a wonky shaped uh, is interesting for who made it. And so I'm going to rearrange here and show you the bottom of this piece, which is signed Affleck. And so this Affleck is Gregor Affleck II, uh, which you may know the Affleck name as the builders of the Frank Lloyd Wright Usonian home over on Woodward Avenue in Long Lake from 1941. Gregor Affleck was a chemist who invented fast drying paint for the automobile industry. And uh, he used his fortune for his Frank Lloyd Wright home, which he finished in 1941 and is considered a wooden falling water. 
and their son Gregor Affleck studied painting, for, uh, model making, as well as design at Cranbrook from 1944 to 45. And so without having any more information, I attribute this to Gregor Affleck II. And the Afflecks and the Smiths were friends. They were social friends. I mean, anyone who goes through the process of building a Frank Lloyd Wright house, um, I think, have a certain understanding of each other. And so it's wonderful that we have a little piece by Gregor Affleck here in the Smith house. Now, moving along past the wooden and glass pieces, which we'll save for another tour on another day, um, we get to this beautiful small vessel, which is by Maya Grotel. And if that name is familiar to you, uh, Maya Grotel was, of course, the head of Cranbrook Ceramics Department um, from 1938 until 1966. She was born in 1899 in Helsinki, and she studied painting and sculpture at the Helsinki Technical Institute. She then worked as a fabric designer uh, when she began studying ceramics in 1926, uh, or, or in 1920, with a Belgian, uh, a English Belgian artist, Alfred William Finch, who had set up shop and was sort of the father of Finnish arts and crafts ceramics. And she studied with Finch for six years before she immigrated to New York in October of 1927 in order to study with Charles Fergus Binns. And Professor Binns was at the um, Alfred College of Art and Craft. He was the first director of ceramics there at Alfred. He's considered the father of American studio ceramics. Grotel studied with him for one year, and then she set up shop teaching ceramics at various settlement houses around New York. So she was part of the progressive era movement of settlement houses. She was teaching at uh, uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey when she was invited to Cranbrook to teach in 1938. Now, she was known for her exploration of simple forms. And so if you know the Cranbrook Art Museum collection well, you know that we have a very similar piece to this at the Art Museum. And she said that she made the same pieces not because she was repeating, but because she was improving. And so she uh, would throw a piece if it wasn't what she wanted when it came out of the kiln. She would make another and another until she had perfected her explorations. And she called it sketching in clay, not in paper. And she's famous for her low-fired, um, very figurative, after the 1940s, very uh, geometric pots in stoneware and in porcelain. Um, and she would use different sort of glazed techniques, from brushed-on glazes to colored slips to carved surfaces. And she's famous for her textures that she would get by using different tools. And so if we get close here, you can see the way that she has really quite beautifully balanced the glaze with the texture of the throne pot uh, with then sort of where glaze is present and where it is absent. And then on the bottom of it, we should see her signature. We'll see a better example of her signature a little bit later on. Now, the next set of vessels are all crystalline glazes. Um, which is a chemical reaction with between different chemicals and oxidation, uh, and it causes these sort of floral forms to develop on the pieces. This first one is from Robert Bennett, who was a Utah-based ceramicist who studied at Brigham Young, um, and he was famed for his wheel-throned porcelain and then his sort of individual floral crystals with sharp colors contrasting the body of the uh, uh, vessel within the crystalline glaze. Now, the crystalline formation, it actually grows within the glaze. So the, the decoration here, though it looks painted, uh, it's not. It's actually a reaction between the glaze on the clay body and then the, the chemicals that were added in order to form these shapes. Next to Robert Bennett is a series of vessels from Phyllis Ehrman, who is an artist that if any of you watching, if you knew Miss Ehrman, um, please reach out to me. We have uh, more than about a dozen of her works here in the house, and she is someone who uh, wrote a 
well-regarded book on Adelaide Aslip Robineau. Uh, and Robineau, of course, is one of the great uh, for founders of American arts and crafts pottery. And Cranbrook has a huge collection of Robineau's vessels. Um, but other than Ehrman's book on Robineau, I can't find much information about Ehrman herself. I do know that these pieces are from the late 70s, with the yellow piece being from 1980. And she's using crystalline glazes of the same color. So her crystals are forming these shapes um, with the same color between the two. And crystalline glazes are pretty interesting because it's a really difficult and precise art in order to time the sequence between firing, resting, glazing, firing. So you have to sort of perfect how you actually are producing the vessel. A uh, cup by an unknown maker. And then two of our most well-known pieces. Um, these are pieces by Gertrude and Otto Natzler. And you may know the Natzlers. You may even have a piece of the Natzlers. They made over 20,000 vessels in Los Angeles. Um, they were an Austrian couple. Uh, Otto Natzler had, was the son of a dentist, just like me. Uh, and he got his start in the arts at a tie factory where he designed colored patterns for ties. Um, he met Gertrude, uh, who was studying art and design and painting. They were introduced to ceramics through the studio of Franz Iskra, uh, where, where, and they studied with him until setting off on their own in 1935. Uh, Gertrude would throw the pots. She was the expert on clay and form. And then Otto was the expert on glazes and firing. So they had a, a relationship that they used from 1935 until her death in 1971, where she made the vessels and he glazed and fired the vessels. In 1938, at the famed Paris World's Fair, which um, our Paris Exposition, which the Saarinens visited and which helped inspire the design of our art museum at Cranbrook, the Natzlers won a silver medal for their ceramics, and they considered that to be their sort of launching off point because they really didn't have tons of experience as ceramic artists. The same day that they won the silver medal, the Nazis annexed Austria. And so the Natzlers, who were Jewish, immediately began uh, planning to immigrate to America. They settled in Los Angeles, where they became famous for using California clays for their vessels. So a lot of California artists before the Natzlers were buying their clays and making uh, non-native pots, but the Natzlers were super interested in learning how they could explore California's own clay to create porcelain and earthenware vessels. They're famed for these um, Weird techniques. This one is called their Crater Glaze from 1948, which has these really deep pockets, and that's all from the different glazes. So it would have been a smooth ceramic vessel before it was glazed, and then it was glazed and fired to create this crater technique. This particular glaze was developed in 1948. Others of theirs, like Pompeii and Lava, were done from the 1930s. And Otto would use things like drafts within the kiln, smoke, ashes uh, thrown into the kiln to create these different finishes. And then Gertrude was famous for these super thin, uh, almost like eggshell forms and how thin she could make a vessel and then how delicate its little foot is down here. And if we look at the bottom, it should have the Natzler signature going across, which is painted on, painted on. And when the art museum reopens its collections wing vault tours, you'll see that there are a number of the Natzler pieces there as well. If you do have questions, go ahead and type them in as we pass by another Phyllis Ehrman, another Phyllis Ehrman up here with green on green crystalline glaze. And then we get to a piece here, which is from a 1962 graduate of Cranbrook, Ralph A. Partington. Um, he graduated from Cranbrook the same year as John Glick, who we'll get to in a moment. Um, and Partington 
went on, he moved to Santa Fe and he became for 28 years the, inst the director of the Institute of American Indian Arts. And so he oversaw um, that art program down in Santa Fe. And this is a piece that he made in 1970 or 1961 as a student at Cranbrook. And so remember 1961, Maya Grotel was still instructor in ceramics at Cranbrook. So this is one of Grotel's students. And I think you can see his interest in balancing the clay body and the sort of maker's hand from the potter's wheel within the, the sort of very earthy glaze. And if we look at the bottom, we can see his signature. A lot of these tags that you see, the 4C, those are from when the Farman group uh, packed up the house in order to do structural work in 2009. And probably as a curator, I should make the decision to remove those tags since they are not particularly historic. Down below the Partington piece is uh, a vessel, another lidded vessel by Robert Diebel. Um, Mr. Diebel worked or studied at the College of Creative Studies, uh, what at the time would have been known as the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts School, uh, which if you followed along at Live at Five, you know that Cranbrook and the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts have a long history with George Booth being one of the instigators of founding both the society and the school. Um, and Diebel studied there and then he worked for over 25 years as a sculptor at General Motors. So he was making clay models of cars. I don't know when he made this piece. It was sometime between 1949 and 1966. And he made this at his uh, pottery in rural Michigan, Pine Inn Pottery, which his son uh, took over and ran until his death in 2011. Let's see, we pass a Richard Thomas uh, metal piece, which Richard Thomas was the longtime head of metalsmithing at Cranbrook. And then we have the sort of celebration of Phyllis Ehrman. You can see why I would really like to know more about her because we have so many of her very beautiful crystalline glaze pieces. But then we also have pieces by her that don't have the crystalline glaze like this lidded vase. And then even smaller pieces from Phyllis Ehrman. And one of my favorites of hers, which is a little bit cast in the shadow here, uh, this green vessel, which has the tiny little sort of a vase for a single blade of grass in the manner of Cranbrook great um, Toshiko And then in the center of this arrangement is another vessel by Maya Grotel, this one in Grotel's famous Grotel Blue. And Grotel Blue was a glaze that she developed using copper oxides. Um, all throughout the 1930s, Grotel was considered to be a uh, the leading woman ceramicist uh, working independently. So she was teaching at those settlement houses, but she was considered to be an independent ceramicist. And she, her research was really quite rigorous into glazes. And so all of uh, those glaze recipes are now part of the collection of Cranbrook archives. Um, you can see a number of them digitized online, but she was working not only on glazes for her own uh, vessels, but she was also developing glazes for the Saarinen family. And so you can see her glaze recipe payoff at the General Motors Technical Center with Aero Saarinen's uh, wonderfully colorful glazed brick. And her most famous color is Grotel Blue. Uh, and this piece, which shows again the hand of the potter on the wheel within the Grotel Blue. And if you know the Cranbrook Natatorium, you know that Todd Williams and Billy Chin, the New York-based architects, used Grotel Blue as one of the glazed brick colors on our swimming pool in 1999. A lovely James Masana plaster piece, a intense studio art vessel with no known maker or mark. So if that looks familiar to you, let me know. <laughs> and then we come down to one of my favorite little pieces, another ceramic artist that 
I have not been able to find a lot of information on. Um, this is by, uh, who made this? My little mushroom. David Hansen. Um, it's dated 1973. Uh, and it has a metal base uh, with this wonderfully sort of mid-century modern form and then this mushroom cloud up above it. Who knows? It's 1973. Maybe it's an anti-nuclear war piece. Um, <laughs> I love it. When I gave a tour to a family member, they said, oh, at one point we all thought about taking something from the house to remember our dear beloved um, aunt and uncle. And this is what I was going to take. And I thought, oh, I am so glad that the Smith family resisted uh, and that we were left so generously everything from the Smith family collection. You can see there is a crack in this piece, so we don't move it from its little spot. And then behind it is this monumental plate, the first of two monumental pieces that we have by J.T. Abernathy. And uh, J.T. Abernathy is someone that I'm sure my Ann Arbor friends all know. Um, he is in his 90s, and he is still working, to my knowledge, uh, over at the Potter's Guild of Ann Arbor. He established the Ann Arbor Potter's Guild, which is a studio, a workshop, and a, a uh, organization in 1960. It's still running. Uh, he helped establish the Ann Arbor Art Fair that same year, and he still displays there. He uh, is from Oklahoma, and during the Dust Bowl, uh, he, he remembers the Dust Bowl as this formative experience that influenced his sort of what he was going to be and, and his aesthetic. He served in the army in World War II, and when he was 23, after having pretty much no formal artistic training, uh, he was known for his doodles and making little cartoons, he took a ceramics class. And he said within his first hour, he told his teacher, I'm going to be a potter. And she said, don't do that. Um, you'll be poor the rest of your life. And he said, she was right, but I was right too. I wanted to be a potter, and he has made his career as uh, a potter. He did study at Cranbrook, and he says that he studied um, kiln building, which to my knowledge is not a degree that we offered, but he was there in the 50s with Grotel, and there are a lot of people uh, who are taking specific sort of programs of study. So in his own, um, in his own records, he says that he studied kiln building at Cranbrook, but he of course would have been under the tutelage of Maya Grotel. And I love this piece because you can see Abernathy's hand uh, and the way that it spins all the way around. And yes, he is 96 or 97. Um, he may even be older than that. Um, and I love the way that he has glazed this piece to have the sort of edge of the ceramic clay body coming out with this very dark color and then the glaze sort of down in between. And this is another piece that has been in the house for quite a long time, since the 1950s. And next to it is another piece by Maya Grotel, showing again her interest in very classical forms that are get their visual interest from her use of the hand and the sort of expression of the clay, and you can understand her wheel coming through. You see how she made the piece, and then she glazes it with these very sort of um, alluringly simple colors, uniform colors, that then create this real depth and richness. And I will set the camera down. We're looking at a wooden sculpture by Sam Apple behind the piece. So I can show you her signature on the bottom. And you see there the MG for Maya Grotel. Now, a lot of her early work at Cranbrook from 38 to the early 40s, she also used the CA logo, the circular C with the triangular A attributed to Aelial Saarinen. So if you ever see that logo at a thrift store, buy the piece. Um, I don't think that there are many that are not signed MGCA if it was her, uh, but a lot of the students in the 30s were putting the CA logo on the pieces. 
And I do know some of you who are watching who have acquired Cranbrook pieces from the 30s at different Royal Oak flea markets in different places. Now on the wall here is a series by Dorothy Dunitz, um, who is another local ceramicist, to my knowledge is not a Cranbrook graduate, but correct me if I am wrong and you are watching. Um, and if you know much about her, I would love to have more information about Miss Dunitz. This is a piece that is mounted to fiberglass and you could not have more different materials connected together. Um, the ceramic, which is going to last forever, um, to the fiberglass, which is, of course, a petroleum-based product that is slowly but surely disintegrating. Um, so this has been checked out by conservators. It's absolutely fine. It's going to stay on the wall for uh, uh, long enough that I won't be the one who needs to replace it. But what it is doing is it is fogging. And so you get that white color coming out behind the pieces. Um, if you look at the historic photographs, it originally really, they looked like they were floating on the bricks. You could not see the plexiglass at all. Moving along, we'll move down to this lower shelf past another wooden sculpture by James Masana to this little candlestick by John Glick. And John Glick is a 1960 graduate of Wayne State's ceramics department and then a 1962 graduate of Cranbrook. Uh, he established the Plum Tree Pottery in 1964 in Farmington Hills. Uh, he closed it in 2016 to move out to California to be closer to the family um, and passed away the, the next year. But John Glick is a really, he was a very well-loved character here in the Michigan pottery scene, um, and he's famous for his functional vessels. He worked in um, stoneware, and he did a lot of throne vessels, but then he also did a lot of pieces that were formed, like this one, where you can see how he sort of rolled out the clay and then almost cut out this candlestick and then stuck the little candle holders above it. It's hiding our temperature and humidity monitor. That's how we know how poorly controlled the climate here is at Smith House. Um, but Glick is famous for the way that he would decorate his vessels. And there's quite a bit of Glick here in the house. So I want to move over and talk about his work elsewhere. As I move into the dining room, we do pass another piece by J.T. Abernathy, who did the giant plate. So this is another piece from uh, the 1950s or 1960s by Abernathy, this really beautiful monumental vessel, which Mrs. Smith used to have um, feathers popping out of, and the feathers came all the way up by the fireplace. So as soon as a company makes synthetic feathers that are alluring enough as her ostrich feathers, I'll put them back, but we do not want to bring feathers here into the house because bugs love feathers, and I do not love bugs. So here's a really beautiful tea set by John Glick, and John Glick was a major tutor to different ceramicists here in Michigan. Um, he had a lot of Cranbrook students and CCS students come through his studio, um, he used all different types of design work. Uh, the way that the Plum Street Studio worked was that he often had his assistants would be the ones who threw the vessels or who shaped them, and then he would help decorate them using a lot of botanic forms. He would use a number of different techniques, whether it was wax resist or incised decoration, stamped texture stains and oxides, um, glazes, blush, uh, brushed decoration, dipped di decoration, dripped decorations. Um, Rosalind Carter used some of his wares at a dinner party at the White House in the late 70s, and Mrs. Mondale was so impressed that she bought a complete set of John Glick dinnerware for the vice president's residence on uh, Admiral Hill. And so uh, John Glick was really interested, and here's another of his pieces, in functional pieces. He wanted you to touch the uh, vessels. He wanted you to use them. He was really interested in the sort of way that clay interacted with the body and how it sort of, uh, how you ate off of his pieces was as important as how they looked. 
Danish piece there from the mid-century. And I'll just conclude our John Glick extravaganza with a few more pieces over here um, showing the incised decoration of John Glick. And then one of his uh, painted plates that I know many of our viewers probably have examples of his plates. Um, you can find them on eBay. It's very much an uh, artist whom you can still collect. Actually, a lot of these people you can still collect. Phyllis Ehrmann, everywhere. No information about her. And then here we see another set of John Glick plates, as well as one of originally two um, vessels, but a little mouse also liked to touch John Glick and knocked one of them off. So it's awaiting complete restoration because it did not get along with the mouse well. And then here you see the way that he almost has this abstract expressionist quality with the clay slip. So it's a thinner, watered-down clay that he has dripped across this piece. And these wonderful little red candles. Now, just a few more pieces that I thought you might be interested in. I know that we had talked about as viewers and your curator that Live at Five would be coming, become a shorter event, but I apparently cannot control myself with time, so I hope you're enjoying all of this ceramics. Um, the Smith family dinner service is Heath Ceramics, um, which Heath Ceramics were established by Edith and Brian Heath in Sausalito, California in 1948. You can see there name there pressed into the bottom. Uh, Edith Heath, Heath was an art ceramicist who got attention in 1944 at an exhibit in San Francisco. Gump's San Francisco, which was a major retailer, asked her to design pieces they could sell. Interestingly, Gump's is also where George Booth bought these storks for the Japanese garden in 1914. Eventually, Heath was uh, making pieces for Macy's, Neiman Marcus, um, uh, Bon Marche in Paris. Heath really became an international sensation. It's low-fired stoneware, so it's fired at the temperature you would fire earthenware, um, but it's very durable. It's more environmentally friendly, and it's all production pottery. So all of this um, Heathware is made for production. And likely the Smiths purchased this at Hudson's. I mean, that's the kind of store that was retailing Heath. I don't know if I would say it was necessarily upmarket so much as a different market um, are the pieces by Russell Wright. And they seem to have been turned by our housekeeper. Um, Russell Wright was a famous American industrial designer who created this series, his American Modern series in 1939. Um, they were in production until 1959 and they were made by the Steubenville Pottery in Ohio, which is another commercial pottery down in Steubenville, Ohio. Um, and this is something that you'll see at a lot of thrift stores. You'll see it at a lot of um, uh, antique stores. And there you see Russell Wright's name. So he's an industrial designer, worked in the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, and this was a line that debuted in 1939 at the Museum of Modern Art as part of Edgar Kaufman Jr. series of good design shows. And so I don't know how you date Russell Wright <laughs> between 1939 and 1959, uh, but the Smiths collected various pieces of his, including this very cool sort of soup tureen. I don't know if it's a tureen if it doesn't have a lid. Um, here's another funny little piece. Um, this one is by uh, Jan Sadowski, who I believe is still working. He went to Groves High School here in Birmingham, um, studied at the Birmingham Bloomfield Center, and then worked for the Plum Street Pottery for John Glick for quite a while. He's still making work, to the best of my knowledge. And then more sort of handmade pottery um, that is by Kolb Hartoum. There's really pottery everywhere here, and we don't have time to talk about every piece, nor do we know information about every piece. Um, up here is another vessel by J.T. Abernathy with his blue glaze and then his uh, leaf forms that he became quite well known for. And there's a, a matching plate that goes with this vessel as well. 
So again, Abernathy is the man who made the giant plate and the giant vase. These are a little bit later in his career. So as I have been talking here, um, you may have noticed that I don't talk about every single vessel um, because we don't know information about every single vessel. So we're applying for a grant to bring back the Collections Fellow position, which brought me here to Cranbrook exactly four years ago this week. I was the Collections Fellow before I was the curator. And the project that the next Collection Fellow will work on is uh, I, doing more research on these pieces. Um, there's almost a thousand individual works of art in this um, collection. We can identify them because the Smiths would cut out newspaper articles about the artist and stick them into the pieces. Some we can identify through signatures, but many of them we just have a name or we have unidentifiable signature. And so the next collections fellow uh, will work on researching these pieces um, in order to hopefully create a book about the Smith House. What makes this Usonian house so interesting is not just the Frank Lloyd Wright design or the Smith family story and how miraculous it is that they made this dream, but it is all of these things, the Smith family collection that's so unusual to have a house built by the original owners, never occupied by anyone else. So uh, hopefully you'll be seeing that book a little bit later. And I just want to, um, let's see, how do you dust clean pottery, especially delicate ones? How often? How long does it take? Uh, you know, we clean things quite thoroughly when we acquired the house in 2017. And at this point, the most dangerous moment in an art museum's collection's life is when it's being moved. And so we try not to move things ever. Uh, and so if you have to move something, you use two hands, you know where you're going, you have a clear path there, and that includes washing these pieces. So some were dirty enough just from environmental dirt, from the kitchen, from uh, open doors and windows that we needed to wash them. Um, they're hardy, so we used a, a mild soap and water. At this point, though, we just use a Swiffer or an all-cotton duster, and there's simply dust um, about every three to six weeks. Um, but again, we're not living here and the doors are mostly closed, so they stay pretty clean. Now, if you'll stay with me, I do want to just sort of wrap up talking about a couple of pieces. Um, this is a, a little piece by another Cranbrook graduate named Tyrone Larson, uh, who is a graduate from the 1960s. And I love this piece. Um, we can see his signature down below. Uh, I love this piece, not because of Mr. Larson, uh, but because this was a gift from Dory Schwedell, who was uh, Melvin and Sarah Smith's ne uh, niece by marriage. Um, and she brought this to the house when she met her future aunt and uncle-in-law, and she thought, oh, they'll like this. I hear they like art. And then she walked into the house and she told me uh, earlier this winter, I was so embarrassed. It was walking into someone who had an indisputable passion and beautiful collection. And I thought, oh, they'll like this. And she thought, I'm never going to see this again. They're going to open it and then throw it out or put it in a closet. And she said that for the rest of her time visiting her house, uh, her, her, aunt and uncle that she was always delighted to see that they kept her little piece on display. And then of course, Dory and her late husband, Marvin Schwedell, helped to maintain uh, the house from Mrs. Smith's departure in 93, all the way up to giving it to Cranbrook in 2017. So just the, the last pieces that I'll mention, this is actually by Tyrone Larson's wife, Julie Larson, who, uh, uh, or, excuse me, this is by Julie Larson, this crazy piece. Um, and the Larsons, Tyrone and Julie, are still working and making ceramics. Uh, this piece is by Pat Bauer, who is another artisan that I know very little information about, except that he made giant ceramic pots. And then down below is another uh, Michigan artist, Alan Vigland. So if any of these names seem familiar to you, if you can tell me more information about these pieces, um, do send me a message, send me a note. Uh, I would love to know um, more about all of these unknown ceramics. I'm not familiar with the work of Meech and Oss. Um, 
Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this rapid tour of highlights of the ceramics collection. Um, in preparing for this today, I'm reminded yet again of how little I know uh, and how much more there is to know about these people. I am not a potter myself. My training from Winterthur, I became very familiar with pottery. Um, but if anything I said sounds suspicious, send me a message and correct me. Um, because there is always more to learn, there's always more research to be done. And I'll end today's tour with just a quick update and a temptation of our new landscaping, which has been brought back to its historic design by Fleur Detroit. And look forward in September or October, we will be doing a full special program about the landscape here, designed by Thomas Church, Frank Lloyd Wright, Melvin Smith, and now brought back to life by Fleur Detroit and Quinn Evans, architects of Ann Arbor. So look forward to that upcoming event. Before we get to the landscape event, I have to uh, remind you that on August 24th, is that a Tuesday? Um, I will be giving a lecture about Cranbrook Academy of Art and the Bauhaus and comparing the great German model, uh, uh, German school of art and design to Cranbrook's School of Art and Design. You can sign up for that Uncovering Cranbrook lecture on the Center's website, center.cranbrook.edu. It'll be at 10 a.m. and again at 7 p.m., so hopefully those times work for you. The wind chime by Paolo Soleri is insistent. Um, thanks so much for watching. I'm Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I'll see you next Wednesday for another live at five on Facebook. And again, we have Tuesday live at five on Instagram. See you soon. I'll end with a gratuitous overview of the living room here as we await some of our furniture coming back from the furniture restoration and going to the furniture restoration. Those are the lamps from outside. Always more to do. See you next week, everyone.